Yeah. All right, thank you all for coming. Um, I will try to speak up. Thank you for spending your Monday night here to learn about the great topic of policies and procedures. Um, I have some staff members here with me to help. Um, Randy Mommy is our children's librarian and videographer. Today, Josh Picka is our circulation and technology librarian, and Zaina Moya is our adult services librarian. So today we're going to be, and she's my I'm clicker. A clicker. So, it's an important I'm job. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so today I'm just going to be talking about how books and other items are selected for the library and some of the policies and procedures we have in place to make sure that they are getting where they should go. Um, so we do have a few guidelines. We like the rules. Um, so today in this presentation is intended to be informative. We're librarians, so we like information. So we are here to respectfully discuss how the staff select items. We're going to share some of our policies and procedures, um, show the resources we use in making those decisions, and inform you of the existing protections we already have in place. So we just ask that everyone be respectful of one another and our staff. Um, next, we have the elephant in the room. So a lot of this controversy that is coming out about the different books that are being challenged at certain libraries, they surface, or they, they center around books about the LGBTQIA plus community, and we are not here today to debate that. We are not here to argue who's right or who's wrong. We're just here to share how we select items for the library. So with that. I would hope though that we're going to be discussing the policy instead of just being about. Absolutely. Yeah. So we are going policy. to start with some numbers here. So this one, it kind of comes one at a time. So we can stop there for now. I just want to share. <laughs> Got too about me. <laughs> so we have um, 137,000 items in our collection. Oh, I'm just going to say, are you able to move that down a little bit? You should be able to drive again. Oh my God, I'm a, I'm a Mac girl. <laughs> okay. So about 138,000 <laughs> items in our collection. Almost 35,000 of those are for children. And just over 7,000 are for teens. Next, um, last year in 2022, we added 11,427 items to our collection. Also last year, items were checked out 223,000 times. So a lot of things are being checked out here at Black. And then last, a little piece of trivia. The number one book, to, book checked out last year, the adult fiction book, but it also was the number one book, was Verity by Colleen Hoover, which was checked out 33 times. So this is a lot of information. <laughs> this is the process we use for selecting items. So <laughs> first of all, as library director, we work at the beginning of the year to decide who is responsible for ordering for which portions of the collection. So then those purchasers, such as the folks we have here today, we have them receive different reviews and information to help guide their decision. Then they're gonna go and use online resources too. So we do have online resources available, um, including some subscription resources that we use. Um, Staff also receive request cards from patrons. So I don't know if you're aware, but anyone can come and request an item be purchased for our collection. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to add it, but we will consider it and we will use those same resources to consider whether or not they'll be added. <coughs> so then our purchasers are going to create a card with which other whichever vendor they're going to. I'm sorry, when, would you mind? This is a little disrupting. I'm sorry. Thank yes. you. There will be time afterwards to talk and um, discuss. So once those purchasers have created their carts, they print them off and give them to me. So I review those. We look at every print copy 
week. And then I pass it on to our tech, what's her title? <laughs> Technical <laughs> Services Library Associate, who also reviews them to make sure we're not ordering duplicates or anything that's out of print, basically. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Then these orders are going to arrive, and that same person checks them in. Again, mostly just to make sure that they're in shape, they're not damaged or anything like that. Then they're given to our technical services librarian, also known as a cataloger. She uses a program called OCLC um, to determine what other libraries have this catalog desk. So while well, it was ordered for the children's library, she's going to check OCLC and get a lot of the information from this database. And that's then, online computer library at Dublin, right? Um, OCLC? OCLC um, is uh, based. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure where it's based yeah, anymore, have, um, um, but yeah, yes, it's it a, yeah. yeah, and it also owns WorldCat, which is a worldwide catalog. So then the technical services librarian is going to catalog them. If that person has any questions along the lines, and this happens occasionally, but not often, they will come directly to the purchaser and ask them. So if there's a fine line about where this needs to go, this person will come and talk to the staff member too. So as you can see, there's lots of steps in the process. Um, all of this is guided by our collection management policy, which is available on our website. Um, I have one copy here also. We can print more if anyone needs to. We can print them upstairs. 13 pages. It's reviewed and approved by our library board. And then it's filed with the North Dakota State Library. So that is what helps guide us. And here are some highlights from that wonderful policy. So throughout the policy, we have different sections related to different areas. The first few, um, we have a portion related to intellectual freedom. So this says that we're going to have material representing diverse viewpoints on topics. Um, and that selection of an item does not indicate that the library or the board necessarily agrees with the viewpoints represented. And then next, we have a statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's what it sounds like. So we are committed to developing a collection that is representative of everyone. And we have made that a, a very strong goal. Our staff are working Sorry, working really hard on this. Um, next thing you know is access to material. So this is just a statement that says that we are not going to deny or abridge the use of the library and that we will not act as a parent to children. Um, we will not restrict access. Um, yeah. Next one is the general objectives of the collection management policy. So just basically, again, we are here to collect materials that will meet the information, reference, research, recreation, entertainment needs of our community. Um, this one is a lot. So these are the criteria that our purchasers look at when we are purchasing. So everything from artistic merit to format, popularity, availability elsewhere. Um, so, for instance, we have a great library at uh, Minot State University. We are not an academic library, so we're generally not going to have a lot of academic texts. If somebody were to request one, we would research what MSU has. If they have it, we would look for them there. We also do interlibrary loan for some special items. Next. More highlights. <laughs> um, so, these are procedures for selections, this mostly just outlines the types of material. Um, we're not going to order multiple copies of things unless they're very popular. Um, the highlighted areas show that we will always strive to balance, um, have a balanced collection, and that's a huge thing with any library <coughs> collection. Um, and again, that it's the adult's responsibility for children, children's reading, and so that would lie with their legal party. 
we have two sections related to our young readers. Pardon me. So the children's library, for us, that's on our first floor right, right when you come in. That is generally birth through seventh grade. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that can be tough to, tough to nail down. Um, what we are looking for when, well, and I say we, but really at this time it's Randy. What Randy's looking for when she's purchasing for our children's library is quality, excellence. We also talk about the diversity. So again, children being able to see themselves and see the world around them. For our teen library, which is also sometimes called young adults, um, we have designated that as roughly eighth grade through 12th grade. It can also be 19, 20. Um, young adult is a very broad term. All right, request for reconsideration. Most libraries that you ever go to should have a policy similar to this. So what this says is that if a person were to find an item in the library that they felt should not be there or should perhaps be in a different section, we have an official method for which you can make that request. It's called a request for reconsideration. So that does involve that the person filing this read the actual book. It does require that they fill out a form, they give it to me, and then I have a week, I believe it is, to read it uh, and respond to that. If the person is unhappy with that decision, they can then petition to the library board. I have noted here that as library director for eight years, I've only had four of these, five. Um, next. So, where do they go? <laughs> This is actually something that we talk about a lot. So even though we have all these policies, we have all these things that we do, um, and I actually do have some copies of some of the journals that we use. They're old copies from like five years ago. You're welcome to take them. But those are examples of what we use when we're deciding on items. But when it comes to children and teen, and even sometimes teen and adult, <laughs> there can be a really fine line. So in 2021, we sat down as a purchasing team for that, um, meaning our children's librarian, our teen librarian, and our adult services librarian, and we decided, okay, what are the age ranges that we are going to purchase for each area? And that's how we came up with the through seventh grade and then the eighth through 12. We've also laid out, these are the resources we are going to use. This is what we're gonna look at, and we're going to try to find out what these resources tell us. If you're still unsure, they're going to pass it to someone else. Meaning if our children's librarian isn't 100% sure if this is a children's book, she's going to give it to the teen librarian to review and see. And when I say the book, it's really the review of the book at this point. Do you have an attorney that can also determine whether this is legal or not? I would refer any questions related to attorneys to the uh, Minot City Attorney. So no, if you. we are still that to, I, that I am not prepared to answer. If their two purchasers are still not sure, then they are going to, one of them is either going to order it and we're going to wait till it comes in to see it, or we're going to decide maybe, maybe it's not for our collection. If it comes in, it gets cataloged. We still think, you know what, this was a teen book, but it's really more children's content, then we can change that. That's kind of our last resort. We don't like to have to change it afterwards, but we do it. It's it's not a problem. So some examples. Next. Thank you. So I have a book here. This is a book, a graphic novel called Twin Cities. And these are the resources that I found and that our staff used to determine what age. Publishers Weekly, which is a journal, says it's for ages 8 to 12. So this Perkins. Baker and Taylor, which is a vendor we use and also has reviews, says it's for ages 9 to 11. Amazon also ages 12. The publisher, which is Penguin Random House, says it's children's middle grade. So 
novelist says 9 to 11. Um, Kirkus on here twice, sorry. Barnes and Noble says 8 to 12. What do we do? We consider also the main characters in this book are roughly 13. They're changing their birthday occurs during this. But there's another one who's approximately 15. So this book ended up in our children's, in, in our juvenile fiction, because most of the resources here are telling us it's about to up to age 12, which would be about seventh grade. Another one, this is actually a series. <laughs> so this is a series um, with author Joseph Delaney, I think, called The Last Apprentice. There's 13 books in this series. This is where the different categories say they all go. Book one says anywhere in grades five through eight to 11 plus. Book two, we're looking at grades five through seven, ages 11 through 13. So you can read this yourself, you don't even need to. But you can tell this whole series is ranging anywhere from 10th grade, that's the highest we go, down to fourth grade. Well, when we have a series like this, we really prefer not to split them up. If you're a reader and you know, if you're a James Patterson re reader and some of your books are on the second floor and some are on the mezzanine, it's very frustrating. And especially for kids who don't always like to ask someone where something is. So what happened was, Actually, I'll have you go forward. forward. I'm going to take these. No, you're right. Oh, okay. I was like, what So this is where the policy and procedure comes in action. So I'm going to talk about that last one first. So we got a request for the last book in this series in our children's library. Well, in the process of looking at that, our children's library realized we have some of these in children's, we have some in teen, we have some in both. Where are we going to put this so our patrons can find them? Because that's the goal. We want our patrons to find them. So, children's librarian read some reviews about the books, looked up all that information. Then that librarian and our team librarian sat down and talked about it. This doesn't happen in a vacuum. We talk to one another about it. When they looked up the circulation usage, these books were checking out better in the children's library. So we move the whole collection to the children's library. The other example that I used, no, you're right. Oh, okay. Um, I'll wait till you give me a cue. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> was Twin Cities. So I happen to be working in the children's library, which doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes they let me. And a patron came in and said, this book is in your children's library. And it promotes selling drugs. Children sell drugs. And the person laid the book out and said, look at that. You put this in the library. And I said, oh, you put this. Um, so we, we have a policy for that. We have, there's a form you can fill out, right? So we went back and forth, tried to discuss it. Ultimately, this person decided not to fill out the form. I thought, this is curious. Let me read this book. So. I read this book. This book is about two 12 year olds, one who live in Mexico, one goes to school in Mexico, one crosses the border to go to school in um, California, I think it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, in that process of separating, it's their first year, they're twins, that they haven't been to school together. The young man meets a 15 going on 16 year old person who smokes and sells marijuana and tries to convince the 13 year old to sell marijuana. It happens on that one page and that's it. Ultimately what this book shows is that that way of life was a very bad decision. I won't spoil it because you may want to read it. <laughs> but it does not at all promote this idea of selling drugs. However, I talked to the children's library and I said, you should read this because I feel like this could be important for teenagers to read just as well as middle schoolers. I think this book shows how hard it is to struggle as you're going into junior high. I think this book shows 
what life is like when you're close to a person and then suddenly you're not anymore. And it shows you what happens when you make that decision. So we discussed it at length for quite a while and ultimately decided to go with the original location, which was to keep it in our juvenile or children's library. I also had, going back to 2021, so I think this was one of the four requests for reconsiderations I had. We had somebody bring a series of books by an author named Abby Glines to me, and they said, this is too mature for the teen library. This was in our teen section. Um, they said, I don't think you should have this. So I took the entire series home, and I read it all weekend. <laughs> And then I thought, you know what? It is kind of mature. Let me talk to some of the staff. So I talked to our team member and I said, why did you choose this? We went back and I went to have a spreadsheet because I'm a librarian and I like spreadsheets apparently. I have uh, what the other libraries have. It. I have Grand Forks has it here. Um, Fargo has it here. I looked at libraries across the state. It's mixed. It's up in the air, right? So I talked to our adult services librarian. I said, I really think because the characters tend to be about 18 to 19, that this could be a fit in our adult section. So we talked about this, we read reviews, we compared it to other libraries, and ultimately we decided to move it. <coughs> so the process does work. We do everything that the policy lays out that we should. And why do we do that? Well, I can go to the next one. Okay. Because <laughs> we strive for balance. We want to have a balanced collection that represents everyone. So here are some examples. We have 637 books on cats. There should be more. We have 700 <laughs> on dogs. More cat people. <laughs> now, if we had 60 books on cats and 1,000 books on dogs, that's not balanced. Also, um, we have 43 books that are directly about the Republican Party, <coughs> 35 on the Democratic Party. 149 books featuring Barack Obama, of which 14 are biographies. 143 featuring Donald Trump, 23 are biographies. We have 872 books on Christianity and 219 books on Islam. Islam is the second most common, most popular religion in the world. But we live in Minot, North Dakota. We know we do not have a strong Islamic society, but we still want to show that. So that is a case where we can say, all right, there may be a little more imbalance there, but you still are representing that other side. So with that in mind, another hot button topic uh, that we have been talking about is related to technology. And a lot of people have concerns about what their children or even what they themselves can access at the library using technology. So we already have many policies in place that will help protect what you do. So first of all, we have an internet guideline that among other things specifically says that we provide filters on all library-owned computers and library internet devices. In addition to that, um, and partially because of this, we have to adhere to the Children's Internet Protection Act, which requires <coughs> that we filter our computers. We filter these computers against obscene images and images of child pornography. Those are not protected under the First Amendment. Second, or thirdly, sorry, every time a person logs onto a computer on our second floor, uh, they have to agree to this um, CASI usage agreement. CASI is the name of the system we use, which says, among other things, that you have to use these resources within uh, ethical, legal manner. Um, they're going to recognize that it can be shared, it should be shared in a way that respects the rights of others and refrain from activities that do not. So we have those measures in place to protect people. And 
That is it. So that in a nutshell is our policy for both how we decide on items and where they go, as well as our technology uh, safety precaution. So at that time, take any questions. Yes. Where does the funding come from for the library and the city order? Uh, we are a city of Minot department. So primarily our funding um, comes from a mill levy. We do receive grants, we receive state aid, um, sometimes for special projects, we'll receive sales tax funding, um, but the majority of the funding comes from property tax. Yes. What was that, um, that sheet that you find on the website that's all the policies? Where you highlighted some oh, of the collection um, management? It's called our collection management policy. What? I have it. Oh, you want a copy? Okay. Um, Lena, if you wanted, you could pull up the website. I think I have it open, okay, maybe not. Um, that's that 13 page document. That okay. Can you yeah. go back to that diversity Ooh. policy that you had up there for? The As a part of our collection and management policy, sure. Can we just pull up the whole collection the management policy? Can you go back to the slide? The slide? Okay. Yeah. Somewhere in there. It's above that. I'm not a very good clicker. Oh, sorry. Can we switch? <laughs> Was it this yeah. one? Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, how did I? What? It'll go back. It'll I can do it. Back. I can do this. <laughs> Add one job. Can you just go back to the other slide? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I did it. I did it. <laughs> when, when was this adopted? Do you know? The collection management policy was just re-approved um, January. So this diversity, equity, and inclusion was never there till then. Oh no, it it's was. Been it's been that's there. what I'm asking. When yes. was the diversity? See, I never saw this until Common Core seven years ago. This was added this in. Language. 2020 or 2021, and it was just re-approved, um, where they said at our January library board meeting. I mean, uh, someone just sent me a picture when I was on my way over here of a policy you have that no political candidates can be in the library, no political issues can be uh, disseminated or, or lobbied in the library. Is that correct? I believe that is our policy for posters, for oh. advertising. Uh, yeah, that we will not, um, and solicitation. And yeah. solicitation, like we don't um, have people petition outside um, and we don't post, or we don't post posters for um, one campaign versus another. Well, the posters I saw were about evidently the issues with the legislators, the legislature, obviously the elephant in the room here about the sexually explicit books. Do we, do we have like, like for instance, we've looked at the century code and most of the stuff's already covered in the century code. I don't even think we need the laws, but I think that there doesn't seem to be a separation of these books from the adult section. Is, is there an adult section versus a child section? Like you said there was, yes, right? Yes. Okay. I would, and that's why I asked the question yeah. about the lawyer. I would think that you would take some of these books, have it reviewed with the city attorney and say, okay, is this sexually explicit? What if a minor child gets this book? What if my librarian who's an adult disseminates this to this child? Is my librarian liable and in trouble for disseminating maybe this pornographic material under the Century Code of North Dakota. That's the question. Um, it is our job as librarians to decide what goes into which category. As far as these laws, as you referred to, um, yes, if this, so as an example, here's a, a juvenile book about puberty. The way the law is written now, I, because I am responsible for this collection, I would be guilty of a class B misdemeanor for having this book about puberty. Not just in the children's library, even if it was in the adult library. 
That is exactly how it reads as of right now. Yes. Ms. Anderson, I am very concerned. I am concerned. I hope to get a lot of people here. I am concerned. I was the one who sent the picture of the display that you have upstairs. Um, because in your display and exhibits policy twice, it is written down, as Mr. Tuttle mentioned, that there should be no um, displays or posters about political issues. And yet there you have, very front and center, you've got the Senate both the Senate bill and the House bill on this issue, taking a very decided stance based on your views. My concern is that you are allowing the American Library Association, which is not a uh, nonpartisan group, it is very partisan, very um, ideological. You're allowing that to sway the opinions of this library. Ms. Bagley, may I ask, where in my presentation did I say I took anything from the American Library Association? It is actually in your collections policy. The freedom to read statement. You yep. reference the, um, and I have the copy. What is interesting, in your 13-page policy, you reference the Library Bill of Rights mm -hmm. and the freedom to read statement from mm -hmm. the American Library Association. Yep. But you do not include, you mentioned there in, in that, Policy with like two, possibly three types that it's included in the appendix. But in the appendix, you do not have that list if you only have three words to find. So I had to go outside oh. of the oh, policy, yeah, outside right. of my non public library page to actually find that statement. And I personally, as a member of this community, yeah. I disagree with much of the information here. I oh, think okay. many of us, I appreciate that you have a, you have a process set up to consider these things. I do want to say that as a public employee though, you have the responsibility to be to and to allow the citizens to interact with the library board and to work with them and our city council. And we do we will take that forward. I'm grateful you acted and put this meeting together very quickly because I was the one who did the comment, you know, the day before you put this this notice out. Um, I am concerned. I am concerned about your public advocacy in front of the state legislature um, for something that I, I don't believe you should be involved. But anyway, that is my question. Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll treat it as if, if I may respond to that, thank you for that. Um, it is my job to be an advocate for libraries. That is my job, and that's what I'm doing. And again, I will say a common misconception that we're hearing is that we are taking orders from the American Library Association. We are not, we do adopt their freedom to read statement and their intellectual freedom because we believe in the freedom to read and in intellectual freedom. But we do not decide what we order based on the American Library Association. And if we did, how is that any different from any other national organization that may be in place? whether it is the American Psychiatric Association or the NRA, how is that different? So, yeah, no, yeah, we do not one. take it that is The NRA is not a taxpayer-funded entity. Secondly, 16.1, known for the uh, century code of practices, does not allow tax entities mm -hmm. to take positions. You can go and you can act neutral and show factual information when you're when you want to testify in the legislature. But I'm I'm getting a lot of copies, of a lot of the text messages that are being sent directly from the libraries to the legislature, and they're not aware that that's a clear violation of the 16.1 corrupt practices. You have to make sure that you're you're in the middle there, that you're objective and you're factual, not taking a side one way, yay or nay. And that that goes for even law enforcement a lot. A lot of uh, laws are being violated down there and testifying on bills. So people just don't realize that that's not because you're paid by the taxpayers. So you're using our tax dollars to take your position. Same as the Hatch Act. You're not allowed to do that. So that's one thing I'm just letting you guys know. That's why you might need to confer with the state's, state's attorneys so, you can, so that you don't violate those. Okay. Anything else? Happy yeah. Thank you so much for giving us. Um, we appreciate okay. it. Um, so I, you know, just as a parent, I think, um, you know, when I see diversity, equity, inclusion, that means something very specific to me. 
Um, it has a very specific definition. Um, it means, you know, through the lens of kind of social justice ideology, it has a very specific need. Um, so, you know, as a parent, I, I guess I'd be concerned about having my my young daughter come to the library by herself, going to the children's section, knowing that the Minot Public Library is committed to developing diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I've seen some of the books that I've seen, um, you know, that are for children, that are graphic novels, are really disturbing, you know, and, I, and I'm sure, I, I haven't been in here for a while, so I don't know if they're in here or not, you know, and, and I said they could not be, but just the, this kind of concerns me, um, and, and do you, have you seen the books that are major concerns? <laughs> okay, yeah, so are those kind of books in the Minot Library, in the, in the children's section? Um, none that I'm aware of are in the children's section. Okay. Um, most of the uh, controversy has been around one book, and we don't have that book. Um, I will say, first of all, diversity is diversity, equity is equity, inclusion is inclusion. You're that's really what biased. we really mean biased. by it. Wait, 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 wait. No, wait, I'm that's, sorry, that's sir. A broad, no. That's a broad statement. We want to yes. include everyone, right? Like we want Christians. to be inclusive to everyone. Mm -hmm. And that is why we have so many books on Christianity. And that is why we have books on being, and we're embracing the idea that children may, come, may have wheelchairs. Children may have hearing impairments. They may be black. They may be white. So that is what we mean by it. Um, as far as, first of all, we are not babysitters. Please do not bring your children here and leave them here. If they are under eight, they should not be alone. That's our policy across the board. So please share that because we get a lot of that with parents are dropping off real young kids here. We are not babysitters. That is not our job. So just a little side note there because that, that happens a lot and we can't be responsible for these Six-year-old to get left here in the summer all day. Long. You don't want me responsible for your <laughs> six-year-old. I just want to let you know. My girlfriend likes the tattoos. With tattoos as well. <laughs> so I have an unrelated question. Sorry, there was somebody right before. Sorry. 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 Um, I was just wondering how how did you come up with the request form? Um, that we were about oh, the request for reconsideration? Yeah. Um, that's a national standard. Um, it's pretty, um, so like when I went to school to get my master's in library sciences, that was the form they gave us. It hasn't changed much over time. Um, so and it's, it's been in place for decades. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. I lied on the back of my head. I know. <laughs> I have a... a an unrelated question that has to do with this facility specifically. Okay. What is Minot Public Library's mission statement? In general, a public library in general terms has a threefold mission. And I wanted to see what how yours is in comparison in the general term of providing education and literacy, providing resources for all sorts of life situations, access to knowledge of factual things and um, and helping to, there's all sorts of things that this library does. And I can't remember what the third one is. This third one along the same line. Oh. It's like education, entertainment, and information in general. Like if I needed to know about Zaoism as a particular religion, I could go to the public library and find a, a reference section it's about that particular right. type of religion. Or I want to learn the new word, so I will find a dictionary. Right. Or, what is the mission statement for the public library? Actually, an excellent question because we kind of just tweaked it a little bit last year. Okay. Um, it was part of our logo. It was Connect and Rich Inspire. Mm -hmm. um, so we recently changed it so that those are our, our uh, core, yeah. core mission. Yeah, um, and instead, our vision is to be the center of information and I'm pulling it up. something to the community of Minot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we um, debated over the wording when we yeah. revamped this have, for... Under, under that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I can look at it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I can remember using the uh, library's public computers, the public resources back when my vehicle broke and I wanted to watch my church services online. I thought I was whispering along with the song lyrics. Um, the problem was the librarians have been very rough to me at that time. 
they basically told me that they wouldn't let me access resources that I had to know about in person. I've never been shown that form, no matter how many times I complained about it or, or said it was inappropriate. And um, this was a couple of years back. I was watching church service online. I thought I was whispering. Somebody went to find the librarian behind my back instead of talking to me. The librarian went and told me I was banned for six months. And I was banned from this taxpayer resource permanently. Would you like me to address that? Um, also, um, I when I went over because of that charming display they have of you know books that the public has complained don't belong in the library. Um, people, were, I mean, the librarian. I, they told me the one librarian had ordered these books specifically for that display when I'm asking questions. I got told. Well, I, I mean, I didn't get told. Excuse me. The other librarians asking her, "Do you want protection?" Because I'm doing something bad. Remember, I wasn't threatening anyone. I was just asking questions. Would you like me to address that? Please. Um, this instance was the 19th incident we had had with this patron. She was singing very loudly at the computer. Three patrons complained. We have documentation of every single incident. This patron has verbally abused our staff several times and has a history of doing so. It is our policy that after after three times, you will be banned from the library. We gave this person 18 chances. Ms. Anderson, yes. a, a proposal, and maybe you can help me figure out um, what would be the best resource to try to, to, to see if this would be a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I love the focus that you have on if the parents who are responsible for what their children you know, ultimately see and read. And, my thought is there's nothing stopping a child who really is dead set on finding a specific book and going up to the parents, you know, the adult section, and, and it's a public library. So that that right. is cool. Is there, I mean, obviously I wouldn't want my kid to do it, but it is, it's there. And we don't want you to have to be, you know, police over that. That's not your role. And I, you know, I definitely appreciate that. Is there a way, however, that books that are of a sensitive nature, sexually explicit, have some kind of barcode so that when, if a child checks it out, that could be flagged and notified if, if their parents notify them. That's a really good question. And we've actually been talking about that a lot. Um, there's two obstacles with that. The first is that our ILS, which is our integrated library system, is we would not be able to do that. We would have to upgrade to a new system. But secondly, everyone's definition of what sexually explicit is different and what Randy thinks is explicit is not going to be the same as what you think is. So there's no grading system. Um, so it is it is something that we have discussed. Um, we were just talking about actually right before this meeting, um, but it's just a, a, a big challenge. Oh. That might be something good for Sorry. you guys to do with the legislature. Yeah. I, I grew up in the West Coast, and if you want to check out a library book at the library community, and it was not appropriate for young, anybody under the age of 18, when they scanned it with their little pen, it popped up like anybody buying a cigarette. It said, you need to check ID, oh. or are they well, allowed to? Yeah, they must have a different ILS system. Yeah, I don't know a way that ours could do that. There was something back in the 90s that they did. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, what's that? Yeah. Um, I'm guessing you take my address, make sure I'm a great living in the apartment or whatever. You have a way of putting a gauge on there so that children's library cards show their age and that if when they're checking something out it says this is an adult book the parent needs to um say it's okay for you to check it out or your parent needs to come check it out that you're 13 this book is kind of like i'm not scared i can't read, check, check out rated our movie when i'm 12 years old why should i be able to check out a rated r book when i'm 12 years old so yes, we do separate our cards out. We have child, 
teen and adult, or is there a middle one? We have child nine and under, child 10, or eight and under, nine to 17, and then But adult. here's the thing, our Garfield mm-hmm. comics are in our adult section, mm-hmm. and children love our Garfield comics, and they love the drawing books. And there was a kid in the other day who has a report on Daniel Boone, and he wanted the book from the adult services area. So, okay, so the books are more sexy. Again, um, how are we going to define that? How do we know? Can it be something like, I don't know, there's a library that you want to read, but as a certain library, you have to have a catalog in your book system somewhere, and just say that this needs to be verified that it's an actual adult check, you know? How do you know what falls into that category? Well, you have a master's on the Do you, do you, do you see how many books we added last year? 11,000 books. Yeah. We cannot read them all. And again, you may think that this is explicit, and I do not. Where does that where does that come? When we separated our movies into genres, oh boy, did we have a fight about what the difference between suspense and mystery is. There is no way we are doing that. Books. We just can't. How do we know if one James Patterson book is sexually explicit, but another James Patterson is not? Also, why are we not talking about violence and drug use and uh, I don't swear words? Like we're only focusing on something that is very narrow and yet broad because we all have a different a different definition of that. Yes, ma'am. I understand there's children in the middle is nine to seventeen. What is that called? Young adults? Teen or young adults? Actually, young adults, but not adults. They are minors. We call them teen mostly. Kids don't even know half the things that are going around. I mean, they are minors and they cannot do it. There are certain things that are minors. Thank you. Um, if I may, so we are getting much, we are trying to call that teen because mostly we found that teenagers don't understand what buying or young adult means. Secondly, I have two teenagers. They can look at Pornhub on their phone, on their friend's phone at school. I can't stop that, but I can stop that here, and I can stop it on their device because I put in parental controls. It's We are providing information. We are not providing pornography. Yeah, yes, ma'am. You have, you know, you, I listen to you trying to understand things, so let's um, talk about section 21. You, what books do you have in this library in that category? What category do you mean? The controversial books with the graphic characters don't be broken by this is why you went down to the library. You know, you give a testimony, you were adamant. Um, so, what books in the library have graphic caricatures of sexual acts for children 8 to 12? Nine to fourteen, and no one asked why because that was discussed in the legislature. So well, that's why we're all here. That's what we want to know. Okay. I'm sorry. Can facts. I clarify? Are you talking about like like comics, like graphic novels, or are you talking about just everything that they talked about, the books that they talked about? I'm talking about. Let's okay. Do you have the book? Let's talk about. It. No. Do you have the book? Sex is a funny word for eight to twelve years. Eight to twelve years. If you have anything similar to those books in the library, that's it's perfectly I'm normal. Pardon? It's perfectly normal. That's where I was the first one. Oh, 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 that's the title. Oh, I thought you, I was like, <laughs> what? I honestly, I, I don't know. Um, I know we don't have, uh, let's talk about it. Um, yeah, I know we don't have this perfectly normal. I just checked to write me down here. Okay. Because that was when I was working as a children's librarian, that was one of the books that people complained about. But it was also one of the most 
checked all ones by parents to explain things to their kids. What was well, the I, third? I checked it out of, of probably about 20, 30 times. So I started buying them from borders up here, and I had to have borders take them out of the children's section from the adult section. What so was, was sorry, in those ways eight years ago? What was the third book you said? So, what is happening? This is alarming to us. So a list of these books, which we don't even really know about, <laughs> is apparently circulating and people are being told these books are back. We have, actually have the books. But have you read them? Yes. Yes. I don't and see I've been, that. Right. City, I've been all over the state. So and again, all throughout our libraries and schools. What happened with this one was a person specifically came in, went straight to the book, opened it to this exact page and said, you have a book that celebrates promoting drug use. And left. They didn't read the book. Well, I can't good. read every single book, and neither can Randy. But we are trusting yeah. that our skills and the resources that we have are going to help us make those decisions. And again, go check things out in our library. Go look at them. Tell me what you find. If you find something, Fill out a form. Let's talk about this. Let's decide why did we pick it? Why did we put that in our collection? Let me share with you that. Yes. I just so about that the legislation that they're talking about. As of right now, you oppose it, right? Correct. So, is there any amendments that could be made where you would support it, or is the intent? Do you, do you support the intent of the legislation, or? Well, I mean, I think the intent of the legislation is already exists in the obscenity code. Um, but yes, I completely understand the intention behind it, which is um, to protect our children, to protect our youth, and to make sure that they are getting information that they can understand and comprehend at a level that, that they are able to process. Every person is different, of course, and every family is different. Um, right now, I, I will tell you the three biggest Issues are that um, one of the bills says anywhere in the library's inventory, anywhere in the inventory. I can't have Fifty Shades of Grey. Do you know whose favorite book that is? Little old ladies. They love the Harlequin books. They do. Y'all can they tell these books. little old ladies that we don't have their Harlequin books anymore. Them. Not me. The other <laughs> thing is, um, one of them, um, twenty three sixty says. Any business or newsstand cannot have anywhere a minor might be present books that describe nudity or partial nudity. That means mainstream books. Well, that's already any in the train station or airport. That's already in the central. What just happened? I said any train station and airport. Too. Right. Well, any you billboard. Also have to, you wouldn't be able to have a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> any book. It's, it's, it's true. You chuckle, but it's true. You also would have to get rid of everybody poops. <laughs> that that has visual description, a visual depiction of nudity in everybody poops. And that is a little kid book about potty training. And based on the writing of these bills as currently presented, that would be a class B misdemeanor for this library director if they held that book in this library. May I share something? In yes. House Bill 405, it does say specifically that explicit sexual material does not include works of art that, when taken as a whole, have serious artistic significance, or works of anthropological significance, or materials used in science courses, including materials used in biology, anatomy, physiology, sexual, or sexual education classes. It's really about but, but this specifically says that, you know, the term means any, you know, it defines specifically what it is. But there is a place to say if the work, like the Bible, when taken as a whole, has significant artistic significance, anthropological significance, and spiritual significance. And my thought is that decision is probably something that needs to be made specifically at the level. There's a significant amount of literature that all other. Yes. Yeah. You know, now we're getting into the weeds of defining artistic significance, which is 
even significantly <laughs> more difficult than defining um, sexually explicit material. Well, so, well, for the next question to you, I would just point out that doesn't include this book because it's not a textbook, it's not a class, and it shows um, post pubert pubert. Why can't I say this? Um, <laughs> human genitals in a drawing. So this book books. Oh, can I speak real quick? Oh, yeah. Okay. Have to go soon. I do have to go soon. So if you have any questions for the children's librarian, let me know because I got to go pick up my kid and get him to bed. Um, also, I did look into those books that you were talking about, um, the graphic ones in the children's, and really the only one that I can think of would be a puberty book, which I myself checked out and um, took home for my 10-year-old to explain to him what's going to happen to his body. Um, and as a single mother, I was happy to have that resource. Um, any questions for me specifically? Yes. Is there an American Girl doll book that talks about puberty? I believe we do. I know we have a lot of American Girl books. Yeah. Um, we have a couple different ones about puberty. Um, some more focused on boys, some more focused on girls, and some focused on both. I chose both because I think it's a book that my son mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I just had a follow okay. up to that just because I think that the concern and I, I share everyone's concern here and, and everything in the legislation. But um what where it gets different is like that for example, this American Girl Doll book, it, it suggests um that you know if you're if you're a little boy and you may feel like you're a little girl on the inside and if you don't feel like you can trust your parents, find an adult that you can trust. So there gets to be like this like predatory movement you know, that is going on, especially with the gender stuff. And so I think that's where parents are starting to go, okay, what, what are these books and why are, why are they telling my child that they might be secretly or mysteriously going <coughs> inside when they're actually a girl? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's where I'm, I'm going, well, okay, so, but it is the parent's responsibility, right? You know, to know what your child is reading and, and all of that. But um, that's, that's where I think it doesn't, like learning about diversity, like, oh, everyone has different abilities and, and you know, and the skin colors and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Totally fine. Um, but again, the DEI, it does have a specific agenda. And I, I'm going to respond that I think that is like a super hardcore conversation, puberty. And I think that mm -hmm. I hope, <laughs> I hope that yeah. every parent is having that with their child. Um, I know that. I check out books that are above my child's level mm -hmm. and I read them before he does. And I think that's important as well for parents. I, I get where you're coming from. I try to steer away from agenda books, but I do want kids to be able to see their own life like, reflected back at them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a book that's like, I have a single mom or I have two moms. You know, they need to be able to see that and know that they are seen mm -hmm. and heard. Um, I went to a conference a couple years ago, um, and oh, always makes me cry. Um, there was this gal from the Pacific Islander, um, and she was fabulous, and she was a doctor, and she knew all of her stuff. And her little girl came up to her and said, Mommy, why am I not in the And that mm -hmm. it hurt me so hard because all these little kids want is to see themselves. And I feel like that's what I'm trying to do the most. Um, another question, yeah. So how do you decide what books are on display and for us? I know I've come in a couple times well, and it's not familiar with it. And some of the books, and I don't agree with them all, mm -hmm. that's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Everybody has different likes or whatever. Yeah. How, how do you decide what books are on display or what the theme for your display is? And who decides that? And is there any special funding? Like, uh, I'm going to come in and give you a thousand dollars, but you have to buy me a Oh, that's no. 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 <laughs> no. I heard that in the school or something like that. Oh, no. I give you money, but you had to buy that. I, I recently um, received uh, somebody had money from Hess and they wanted to buy me books about trees. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, and they were like, here's the list I have. And I was like, let me see your list. And I crossed out nine of them because I already had them. So I found some other books about trees that were just as good. 
you know, because 25 books about trees. What's about trees? Um, but as far as displays go, um, what we really try to focus on are things that are not going out as much. So there's a couple different displays. We have our main display in front of my office, and those we try to focus on things that are not going out as much. Um, so I believe we have cookbooks coming up soon or poetry or something like that. Um, and we try to pick from different formats so that we have stuff for the little kiddos and we have stuff for the big kiddos and we've got, you know, audio books and the little playaways so that kids all feel included in what they're reading. Um, when we do the sweater weather, weather theme um, for the winter, we grab books for that. Um, I think maybe the one that is a little different is the staff favorites um, because everybody's got a different favorite book, you know. Um, we also have a display in the back, which is our preschool area, which is moved right now because we're working on a remodel. Um, and those are all the super popular books that we can't keep on the shelves. It's just easier to put them up so the kids can be like, I need Paw Patrol. Um, and then we have our popular section, which is a lot of Legos and superheroes. <laughs> so we have a couple of different displays going on. Um, and I have an assistant who works on that, but I give her like an idea of where I want the display to go, looking at our stats of our collection, the circulation stats, to see like what books are not being loved right now. I gotta tell you, it's always poetry. Kids do not love poetry. Adults don't either. <laughs> they don't either, to be honest. It also doesn't circulate well for me. <laughs> uh, so that's where we come up with our ideas for display. So how do you get um, to bring new books in if you wanted to bring books in that you think are really going to be good at the economy if you don't have them anymore? How would you get those ideas in the market? Don't like donating no, just different oh, books from the authors. You just, you oh, just ask the class for a dozen books in the last couple of years. Yes, you have. Yes, so <laughs> many. Yes, smart. Actually, when they get to the pull up, you can request them online. It goes directly to my email. <laughs> you know, that's just part of me and to read for my history and write it, but um, to put it on the shelf for the other kids. Yes, um, that's the request for purchase. What we would do is we would fill out a card. Um, you would be the first person on it. So yeah, you would be at first. That kind of goes back to that uh, diagram thing. Um, and you got a request to purchase a novelization of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. And it was really poorly written and it had really bad reviews. And we said, no, we're not going to get it. it like, but instead, she instead, said, we have this other book about Sonic the Hedgehog. So well, instead, I ordered a graphic novel compendium of Sonic the Hedgehog, which was very nicely done. So not every, I would say we order we order 90% or more of our requests, but there are, and sometimes it's because they're out of print, so they're really expensive to get. Or if hard they're to get. super old. That's yeah. kind of hard. If they're really old, it's hard to get them. Um, most but of yeah, them they have pulled it up on our website. There's a request online, or you can come in and we'll fill out a card for you. Or you can give us a call. specifically for Children. me before I go? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You said that you put out stuff up at the front for people, books that haven't been loved recently. Yeah. Do you make sure that those books that haven't been checked off, checked out, like this community may not check out a lot of LGBTQ books? Do you decide that, oh my gosh, this community hasn't checked these out, so we need to put them out in front? I mean, or do you decide to keep that in the back and just like maybe red trucks is something you don't? Need. I, I don't think like that, honestly. I, I think more in like I, I the collection. Okay. So LGBTQ is not a collection we have. Um, we have a cookbook collection and we have a dinosaur collection. Okay. Um, there are LGBTQ books within a collection, but. Well, and I will say, um, part of our policy also includes. Oh, yes, yeah. thank you. Part of our policy also <laughs> includes the um, process for withdrawing books. And the way <laughs> the way we do that is usually based on usage. So, if something is not checking out for a long period of time, then we're going to withdraw it from our collection to replace with something else. Now, there are some caveats to that. So, there are certain books that libraries should have. Um, cool. I don't core collections. It. They said gore. No. <laughs> no. I, mm -mm. I was trying to think of like a specific one, but like this Charles, Charles Dickens. Charles yeah. Dickens. 
Like there are books that maybe they're not checking out, but we should have them. And those would be something we would put. Last year we did a display. Um, we had a list of core collection books. These are books that everyone should kind of read that hadn't circulated. So we did a display and it was like, check these out, you should read them. Um, but if nobody checked them out, then we went through them. So yes. Your, that, that term for collections um, is in your policy. I was wondering, that was one question I had. Where do you get that for collections from? Is it something that you put together yourself, or where do you get that? It's an online subscription database that we um, pay for. It actually used to be books. It had fiction and fiction, and then it went digital. Um, so they is pulling it up in our digital resources now. Um, and that, uh, they gather information from reviews, um, but also from librarians and teachers when they decide, like, you know, this book is core to your collection. This is something that you should definitely have. And then others will be, this is highly recommended. This is, uh, what's the word I was saying? Supplementary. Yeah, supplementary. You know, I was ready. You don't necessarily, <laughs> right now, it's basically defaulted to middle and junior high core collection. Um, maybe it's not. Well, no, it's it defaults to all. Who puts that, like, it, who, what's the official body or nonprofit or group that puts that core collection on? EBSCO. Um, EBSCO is a database uh, vendor. Yeah. FYI, yeah. um, yeah. let's go get a lot of their information from Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. so. Library is what? Library, Library. 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 Jim, do you mind if I make a quick comment? Please. I'm the, I'm the Library Board President here. I'm just a normal guy who likes to read <laughs> and yeah. check out a lot of books. Kind of amazing. I've race. got a couple of board members here with me. Oh, we love the, the fact that you guys care about the Library. Yeah. That's awesome. I think we really want to make sure that you guys are aware of this kind of shit because honestly, no one ever comes to our board meeting. Seriously, seriously. There's a personal parents section. I would love to have anybody. Personal parents section. Third Thursday of the month, or 15th. Third Thursday of the month. Yes. 17th. Oh, is it? Right at the room, right next door. So, and, and, and I, I love the fact that we've got these policies that we review every year, and that you guys can come in and say, hey, I read this book, and I don't like this book in my life. Definitely, definitely make that um, recommendation, recommendation, request, request for, for reconsideration. Yeah. yeah. Definitely have that there. Definitely yes. have that there. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. definitely, definitely do that. 15. If you've got a book that you know is in our library, book, like you know it because you checked it out and you read it, right? Clearly, I mean, you're not just making up for you know pretending that it's it's there when it's not. Just let us know. I mean, there's so many books, so just just make us aware of it. We don't want to have something here that you don't want to have in your public library. We'll review it. It'll go through the process. You'll have your chance. I think that's I think that's awesome. But if that's I can't add to that too, um, sometimes we're gonna disagree. Um, like mm -hmm. some, and that's. We heard a lot, and I, I hear a lot of people when I say, you can go out this far, and they're like, oh, it doesn't work. You don't listen to me. And they won't listen. Well, when I respond to those, I have to provide you facts as to why. And usually those are going to be book reviews, right? Um, but you have another chance after that where you can come talk to the library board. We've got a really great library board. Um, and they'll hear you out as well. So, um, yeah, don't, don't. Don't be scared of the form. I think you have been. Yes, yes, sir. Don't fight. Don't fight. That's the one question. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a new point. Uh, it's an appointed position. It's appointed by the mayor. Um, but we generally don't have a, well, a ton of interest. Last year was great because we advertised that we were, and we had like six people interested. Um, and then the library board as a whole, like we kind of reviewed their letters of interest, I guess you would say, and um, made a recommendation to the mayor and the mayor. Sorry. Five, and it's state law, only five can okay. be on there. The terms run June, no, July to June, and it's a three-year term. Um, really, so when it when we have openings again, which I think we will have one this June, uh, I think Lindsay's term is up. We'll put up some signs at the library and we'll put something on our social media and we'll chat or something like that. And that's how we got Christine. She sent in an actual letter and came to the meeting, um, which was a huge boon because like, none of the other applicants actually came. Um, so we were like, sure. Yes, sorry.
Um, I was going to ask, you claim that I was abusive to mm -hmm. the, the staff and that I was loud. You got videotape. Um, and the minute I knew there was a complaint, I started bawling too. Um, this is off topic, so I think what, this wouldn't well, be a good place to discuss it. Right this public areas. And by the way, I'm nobody, but remember I did attend quite a few meetings too. I think that was before Mark was on the board. Yeah. It was when we used to meet upstairs on, in the tool closet. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the tool closet then. <laughs> now it is. <laughs> Still says conference room. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So when you have your policy, is it a recommended policy from the library association, or do you guys come up with this type of policy? Um, they come up. I sit in meetings and we we make them all ourselves. And we argue about the exact we wording. We might, take we might take ideas here and there. Mm -hmm. Pull them, pull them here, pull them there. But I sit in meetings for hours and I go <laughs> hours. Not all myself. <laughs> hours. And if I may just say, like, for instance, from being did a tool library, we're the first and only library in the state of North Dakota that does a tool library. We didn't know what to do, so I reached out to a library in California and I was like, hey, you have a tool library. Can you share some of your policies with me? And we use those to tweak them. We yes. love your tool well, library. It's awesome. <laughs> I can speak to that question a little bit. I used to be president of the Ward County Public Library, and I was president cool. when we went through the policies and procedures. And what we did there, and I don't know how they do it here, but what we did there is we looked at policies and procedures for most of the libraries in the states and kind of picked out, okay, this makes sense for our library, this works for our library, this is something we need. This is something that's redundant and it goes that way. As like Mark said, is or what like Josh said, is ours. Yeah. Zena didn't want to talk, so the fact I that didn't. I just want to add with that that it's also not something that we do one time and we never look at again. That would be so nice. Last year in its entirety, our like we went through our entire reformed special committee and went through our entire policy and procedure manual page by page. And it took 182 pages. It was 182 pages. And we literally went line by line and said, you know what? That doesn't make any sense anymore. And then we put it out and staff said, this doesn't make sense still. So we went back to the drawing board. And so it is a continual document. Um, so it is not something that we have like just pulled from willy nilly and decided whatever. And these meetings are three to four hours long, in my opinion. I bring <laughs> snacks and a blanket. Like I'm like, all right, let's argue over wording. So this is something that, like I said, we literally, like, it's ongoing. We sit and go through word for word how this is. Yeah, and then the board. Yeah. And then they come back, and, the, and Janet's like, well, the board thought that you should do this. And we're like, okay. And we go back and do it again, even though we all love our board. What section is Deadpool at uh, Deadpool in? Uh, Deadpool one and Deadpool two. DVDs, graphic novels, DVDs. What uh, action oh. probably? Okay. I mean, for DVDs we have by genre. Again, that was a huge thing. So I believe that's an action. Um, I believe the comics are going to be an adult graphic novel. I think. Yeah, I think so. If we, what yeah, if we have them. Um, just adding on to what Zaina said. Every single staff member has Brandon's to a staff member, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, every Brandon. staff member has to attend, I think it's two all staff meetings a year. We all input our recommendations, our questions about policy, and that's almost 30 people, right? 25. Yeah. 25 people from all backgrounds, all opinions, all belief systems all sharing their opinions so when we get this final product it is a lot of people going into work for days and then it changes two days later yeah <laughs> we decide to add something new mm -hmm. uh, back there. Hi. yeah no sorry in front of you okay um quick question just if this is a bit controversial um but i think this is just more of my Info, whatever. But um, are you guys carrying any 
and what ages are the books in if you are carrying any on gender reassignment? I do not know. I, do you know? No. I can um, pull up the catalog. Like, <laughs> like Janet, and there's over, there's so many books that we have. I, so, um, but I don't know. I off the top of my head is like order by order. Um, so we'll show you how to search our catalog. Yeah, as soon as it loads. Yeah. While we do that. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, anyone can. Yeah. Yep, yeah, everything's out there. Yes. I understand we have a lot of folks with diversities. I mean, and but I think we solve a lot of problems adults for minors when they can't live at the university. I mean, people with information, what they do have those credit children, you know, the way they show up and really end up with the community. I think just for the adults, minors would be good here. Yeah. A nice thing to do. And that's great that you're active. And I'll say, uh, in all four times I've gotten a request for reconsideration, I always start by saying thank you for being concerned because I genuinely am grateful that somebody took the time to read this book in its entirety, I hope, um, and fill out the form and that they're concerned. Um, so so thank you for that. All right. So this is our catalog. I typed in gender reassignment. I only got four books. And as you can see, they are all nonfiction books in our adult section. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, under the new legislation, these would be illegal or not? It depends on how it sense. says sex based characteristics. So, theoretically, yes. It's so depending on what they mean by, by sex based characteristics. I don't so, think so. Um, but I explicit sexuality in the books. But because no. it, it lists all of these things that is considered sexually explicit, and the very mm -hmm. last thing that's listed is the sex characteristics. It's, which it's, which we don't know. We don't know. Exactly. <laughs> Serious. Yeah. So to me, when I see sex characteristics, you're you're talking about somebody's biological sex. We we oh, honestly okay. don't know what some of this is, and and we're trying to get answers. And that's um. So that that is to go back to I forget who said it. There are, there are changes that can be made that are going to make this so much easier. And hopefully, I'm not going to go to jail. But I asked Jenna today. I was like, um, "You're the one going to jail, right? Because I'm not, <laughs> I, not I." Yes, I am. No, it's fine. Yes. Um, how many of your graphic novels are adults only, and how many are in the teens? Okay, so graphic novel. How many of you have read a graphic novel? Yeah, that actually makes me really happy. Um, so graphic novels are a very interesting thing. So this is a graphic novel. This is not a comic. People will call it a comic. Um, I was never familiar with this till I went to grad school for library science. And the most interesting thing that I always remember from this is so when parents are like, oh, you don't want that. It's a graphic, it's a comic book. It's, yeah, it actually yeah, takes yeah, very yeah. special brain power, so to speak. To be, this is actually Thank helping you. your brain grow to be able to do that. So graphic novels, are a full novel, a full story with pictures. Comics, because we do also, we have some comics that go like Garfield and Peanuts and that, and those actually go in our nonfiction section because it's under comics and humor, I think. Yeah. Um, and then we have <laughs> manga, and manga is hugely pop pop popular. I cannot read it for the life of me because <laughs> You read it right to left and backwards to forward. You know this, don't you, Connie? You know. So how, like, you read it like this, and there, it's like anime is to American um, cartoons. So they're Japanese-based, generally, um, hugely popular. Teenagers check them out, like, armloads at a time. We have a max limit of 50 out at a time, and I had to have a teen put some back the other day. I was like, you already got. 47 items out and she was distraught <laughs> like but i have 18. so it's kind of hard to answer and then we also have um like this one actually was in our juvenile section right and we have this really adorable graphic novel for kids called narwhal and narwhal and jelly i think peanut butter and jelly um so we have them all throughout the library i don't know what you got from us um there. so i did some advanced searching and i was able to pull up anything that has what we call a call number. That's how you identify a book. 
Um, so GN stands for graphic novel. So uh, <laughs> I would say that this, this system isn't perfect, but it was as accurate as it's going to get. Um, over here has like by age range. So you can see these numbers here. This is how many items that have call number GN in it based off of the age range. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have more adult books than we do uh, anything else, but the teens, it's, I think it's that manga. Yeah, it includes the manga. The manga, if you haven't seen the physical section, it, they are small books and we have a lot of them. Each yeah. of the series of, there are some that have over 50, 60, 70 books um, in it. So that's where those are coming from. I just want to address the, uh, issue of limiting uh, someone's ability, a younger person's ability to check out an adult book. When I was young, which is quite a few years ago, <laughs> I, was, I was through with the Party Boys and Nancy Drew books oh, yeah. by fifth grade. So I went to the public library and starting from the summer after my fifth grade, I started reading adult detective fiction. And then I read seventh or eighth grade, I read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, because I was interested in history, 800 some pages, Count the Monte Cristo, all those books. I would have had a hideous life if I, they had not allowed me to check out those books. In my day. So everyone has a different range. No, the books weren't as filled, although The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich was a lot about horrible Nazi treatment to people. That was, but it was, I learned something about the world then and how evil people can be. And I was ready for it. Uh, detective fiction men didn't have as much sex as they do now, but I I enjoyed the challenge of it. I was ready to, and I would have had a horrible life if I had not been able to do it. I just wanted to tell you, everyone has a different range. Um, there weren't, as I said, sex was in it, but I was ready for having a much bigger world and understanding as adults. I learned a tremendous amount, and that made me happy through those years. I was a reader. What would I have done? You know, I mean, I'm just saying it would have been a miserable life if I had to what read. What would I have read? In my time, it was Flowers in the Attic. Like that was the <laughs> you advanced from Sweet Valley High, BC Andrews. So, um, so oh, did you? Have some? Uh, I no, was there? She had something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Right. So, like, it's about anyway. Um, so I was uh, with the request for reconsideration, does that cover um, displays and then your your digital um, message board outside? Like if, if there would be something, or is that just strictly the books when you see something? That's a really good question. I don't. I would say our display policy, and like Josh, who's on the policy and procedure, can correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, mostly pertains to our like lobby displays that we allow like the like local artists to come and display their work as well as um like what we can put up in that community section of our board that is what the main intent i believe the policy was designed for and that can is I what it targets for to i could be roared, wrong but i believe at one point there was a complaint about an art display we had do you know if we use that same form? I assume you could use the same form. Like, I would there, were, there have been a few complaints about things that have been displayed in the lobby for the years, and they always went back to the stuff in the policy. The display, that we yeah. Had, and they made the decision based on that. I don't know that they took them out because they adhered to what was in the policy. Another thing to add to the policy yeah. procedure committee, Ugh. we can see if there's a separate thing we can do. Yes. Janet, you know, a lot of questions with the library today, but here's an opportunity for you to kind of, how many people come to the library on average year? How many books are checked out? What are the things you offer beyond, obviously, books and, and the tool checkout? So what are the other things that are offered here? Um, over 200,000 items were checked out last year. Um, we average, um, would you say, 9,000 people in every month? Yeah. Um, 
that's probably in a low month. I seem to, it feels like it's a higher number. Um, we have free programming for all ages, um, from the little ones. We have a lap set for babies all the way up to our adult programming, which Zaina does. Josh spearheaded and has now passed on um, technology education at the Parker Senior Center, Edgewood Vista, and now Ellison Assisted Living. Um, Spot said we have a tool library. We have adventure packs, so you can check out a telescope and you can check out a micro. Well, yeah, you can actually soon. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Stargazing. We're working on a really fun new collection that will hopefully be available in the summer. Don't forget the National Park Pass. Oh, oh yeah, the State Park Pass. It's not National. Oh, not yet. State National State would be State nice. State. I like that. We sell them. We don't yeah. sell them. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of that equity. Right. right. And that's, we goes back, right? Taxpayers pay for this library. So you don't have to pay to come to do any of these yeah. things. Just come check them out. Come check out a chainsaw and then get a pass to the state park. Maybe take the binoculars with you, though, if you can go bird watching. I, I guess I've never, I don't know anything about the, the Ward County Library, but I know it's there. I drive by it. Why is that? I know it's separate from you guys. You guys work with them? Is there, how would we promote both of them? Do they have different things than what you have here? Obviously, they must. And that might be a Carnegie. And the building kind of looks like it. We actually were the original Carnegie Library. You were the Carnegie. Opened in okay. 1902. Uh, <laughs> 19, no, I think our library, our library started in 1902 and moved to the Carnegie in 1911. You tell them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the Ward County Library, and this is interesting, this was Susan's time on the board, wasn't it? We several times have talked about merging and it's never gone through. Um, Ward County services the county. So they have a branch in Kenmare as well as the one downtown. And they have a bookmobile that goes around the counties. It goes to my kids' school in Dallas. Um, we do complimentary programs. We try really hard not to host like story times at the same time. We work really well together. We talk together. We um, do summer reading together. But they generally have very similar services to us. They have a smaller um, location in the County Courthouse, um, admin, or the admin building, but it's a really nice space. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. I did not encourage you to bring your materials from them to us. Um, that happens quite often. But Just want to put that out there. But if you do, because we have a wonderful relationship with them, their library director occasionally stops by and we say, we have a stack of stuff for you. Uh, so. Yeah. Martina, and then just FYI. Um, if anybody wants to come to the MSU library and become a member, you most certainly can. Or if you pay your twenty dollars because if you're not a student, you have to pay twenty dollars, and you can use their library for a year and you can check out whatever you want. Your free and they have great databases too. Mm -hmm. Are they as big as you guys or bigger? They're smaller. They're smaller. I would say, I don't know. I'd actually ask. Yeah, they're more academic. Yeah, and they're yeah. different. So yeah. Right. Yeah, they're not going to have all of this. Melissa? Um, I can tell you a little bit about the difference between this library and the Ward County Library. Um, I'm kind of a noted bookworm. Um, the Ward County Public Library uh, it does keep material for more than 10 years old. For the longest time, this place's criteria is that they don't have books on hand. That are more than 10 years old, unless they're still frequently being checked out, or have, um, I, I, what did you say about it? Core collection, like it's a uh, core collection type thing. Yeah. And Carrie does attend a lot of political events. I don't know if she participates in them, but she's the head librarian over at Ward. Um, you, have, you probably saw her last time because she was over there. At the degree. I know something else. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, my two children came here and they're two of the to call that. What are you doing here tonight? Stop! I just felt it was a safe haven for my children to be here. And we would come to the children's library as long as I could see them. I knew they were going to be okay. 
it was distributing to see that some of the books out there might be in this library, just to make sure that they aren't. Um, I never considered having to fully switch because they weren't that what they were looking at. And even when my children went up to the teen section, um, that one that says my son was eating with every one of them. And he still loves to eat. <laughs> I didn't like it, not to eat them But I just want to thank you guys for offering this tonight mm -hmm. and to be open about everything. Um, I, I didn't understand what the university was with the problems that we were having this section, so I'm mm -hmm. glad to be able to see that. And like I said, I'm just glad to know that we are part of the conflicting parts that are going on with the legislature. We are looking up for this. And I think that books are in the appropriate sessions, and if they're not, we are open to read them. And as parents, we know what our kids are like. They're going to be curious about things. But we also have to understand that we have to follow the judgment and hope that we have parents have done the right thing to guide them into what the education goes for. We're coming from the library of the world. Thank you, guys. Well, thank, thank you. you. And uh, yeah. just, Connie's children are amazing. And tell the writer to come see yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, What's to stop a minor from checking out a DVD like Deadpool where they have that lovely scene with Stanley in the bar, the stripper, the strip club? You know, complete with the nudity, or for some of those other charming graphic novels, like the ones that were on display, like the guy that committed suicide and had all these nude things with his girlfriend in the graphic novel, um, and the uh, one where the girl gets a hold of this magic axe where she can decapitate people, and they still the heads are still able to talk to her. The parents. Um, the parents. And also, we have a self checkout machine. So even if we put some of these input, um, these rules in place at the checkout, they're going to find them. And I'll tell you also, our highest theft is our <laughs> parental advisory music CDs, probably because those kids can't check them out, so they steal them. So that's, that's nothing for any of us to solve right now. I'm just, I know. It's an interesting topic. But, um, these um our youth are really smart and they're we are so lucky that they're gonna run our future because they're so much better off than we are <laughs> or we were when we were young but they're gonna figure out how to get the information um and so i want to be able to get them accurate information and hope to facilitate these conversations i can't me in your homes, but hopefully these conversations are taking place, and maybe some of these books can help start those conversations. I just, um, I, I agree. It's, it's absolutely the parents' responsibility. I think, unfortunately, um, gone are the days where you really can just send your teen and think they're just gonna, you know, read about Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. Um, I. I'm just reading an excerpt of me and Earl and the Dying Girl. And I won't read it, but it's a it's a book that's available in the teen section. Mm -hmm. Um and it has very, very explicit sexual content in there. And so I mean I don't know what the answer is for that. Obviously it's you know parents are responsible for their kids, but um just knowing that our our public libraries, you know, they have sexually explicit books for teens. I mean that's just Kind of what we live in. I don't know. Very like, um, yeah, that, that book is called Meet Girl and the Dying Girl. Is that a very popular one? Um, it was a motion picture, it was on the title. So. Um, mediumly popular, yeah. All right. yeah. When it first Not came out, or or some of these like, uh, fantasy series, yeah. like yeah. Yeah. the or, Court of Thorn and Roses, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Something like that. Okay. So, like, if I were to, you know, say, hey, you know, would you consider removing this book? Like, what would be the criteria? Would, would that be enough to be like, oh, maybe we should remove this? Or, in your opinion, would that be okay? So, that's a really good question. Like, we yeah. walk through, like, how we would do this. So, um, if that request were to come in to me, so I would read the book, um, and then I would look at the reviews, and I would see um, where the different you know, professional journals have said it should go, and they would also compare it to other libraries in our state, because I also feel like sometimes um, some of these national journals maybe don't reflect quite um, our state. We get a lot of 
um, reviews for urban romance, which is not super popular here. So mm -hmm. we don't take everything in those journals. Like, um, but um, so we would look at those reviews, and then I would talk with the purchaser. So in that case, that would be our <coughs> number again. Um, we would also look at the circulation, honestly, and see like, is this being checked out? Is it um, in the right place? This is this, like with that Abby Glein series. It was a really um, cuff, and I went back and forth about where it should be. The characters are 17, 18, getting older, but they weren't being checked out very well where they are. And I think they're actually doing better now. They well. are, which I don't like, cause I like that specific, uh, right. I disagreed. I didn't think that they should be moved to the adults and uh, Janet and our teen librarian, Pam, uh, like I said, it's an, a discussion that we all have um, and we all aren't going to agree. And then Janet decided to move it and now it circulates better and I was proven wrong. Um, so, and that's fine. <laughs> but, but I might also say no. It's, it's <laughs> In that case, um, so in that case, we can we will communicate by letter. Mm -hmm. um, so you get a letter in the mail and it can say, um, "This is why I just made this decision. Um, here's what you can do now. This is when our next board meeting is." Kind of thing. So, Wait. you yes, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so, I need a um, laser point. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you've had like four of those requests. Mm -hmm. How many? And I know it's not, you can't probably get an exact number, but would you say you get quite a few people just coming in directly and, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and saying they would like you to remove the book or concerns or whatever? Unfortunately, I work in an office all day. And <laughs> no windows. And they don't let me interact with people very much. No. So I would, it just, I just That's happened it. to be covering the desk when this one happened. I'd say it's very rare that. Yeah. Somebody would say that if they did, then we, we would give them a form and encourage them to fill it out. Um, you know, it doesn't happen too often. I, I don't believe you have asked me for a material like that. Oh, yes, I, um, I just was we'll here about the process of what was happening. Have you guys ever considered that maybe some of the um, the companies here that use to review books that they are possibly skewed in a certain direction, like when it comes to sexualizing children and younger and younger age. It just seems like that's happening across the country. Yes, yes. and no, mm -hmm. because you can have it both ways. One of our newest ones, I don't even know if it's in that policy, um, is mm -hmm. Common Sense Media. Um, and that is um, a website. I actually encourage your parents, you should use this because um, like if I'm not sure if it's a movie my kids should watch or a, um, or a book, like I can go to Common Sense Media and it gives you, this is what parents think the age range is. This is what kids think the age range is. So um, that one tends to skew more on the conservative side of like less um, graphic. Um, Kirkus. The it's main really the main reviews that we get are usually done by just librarians, just um, regular librarians who volunteer to write reviews for books. They're not by a certain company usually. And like I said, I have some examples in the back. These are like after a few years, we eventually just toss them and soon we'll recycle them. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so you're welcome to have some of those. And it shows you, it even gives you profiles of like who's doing the reviews and stuff like that. So the reason we use so many is so that hopefully we do. So library journal is not going to have the same reviewers as Publishers Weekly, and that's not going to have the same reviewer as Book List. So um, we actually, again, we just got another one today where there was a very like kind of adult themed teenage um, teen book, and our teen librarian wasn't really sure about it, but it didn't fit in the adult section. And when we dug a little deeper, it did have one good review. And the others were like, this is kind of a crappy book. So it was scathing. It was kind of scathing. So, I mean, that's where we hope we rely on other professionals who are trained to, to help us in our profession. Yes. Um, so we have to know this form exists and ask for it in order to do a complaint form. Because when I came in here, 
you were holding up that graphic novel and you were saying that the person that went to it, you offered them a form. Mm -hmm. So it's basically only the people you like you offer the form to. Oh, it's not right. just oh, having fun. Yeah. Yeah. It is available online also. <laughs> and I, it's more of a comment too. I thank you for doing this. And I think as parents, we, we worry about what our children are and our futures, our children's future in this nation. We feel like things are kind of being shoved down our throats sometimes too. And diversity, equity, and inclusion, not all that we want. And so I don't want to be, this is not us, me as a parent coming in here against you, the librarian. This is about us as a community trying to raise productive citizens in the future. And so I don't I, I don't want to work against you, I want to work with you towards that. And I just thank you for you know making every effort to ensure that it I just say I agree because my daughter just got her driver's license today. Yay! And she's out <laughs> driving for the first time on her own and so I kind of like um but like I get that, like we're we're worried about that. But um when we talk I know there are there are words out there that have suddenly taken on these political connotations. And to me, diversity, equity, and inclusion should not. Like we want to be those things. We don't want to push an agenda of we're only going to have um, left-wing things or right-wing things. We want people, like Randy said, to see themselves represented, and we want people to feel welcome and included <clears throat> here um, and safe here. And sometimes that means seeing themselves in their books. Sometimes that just means having a space to go where they know nobody's going to be um, harassing them to sign a petition or something like that. So um, it is, it's kind of a shame that those words have taken on a, a different connotation, but that's not how we take it. And we've actually, we've done a, a diversity audit of our a youth collection. I wish I could really talk about it more. But we basically, like, she dove into our picture books, I think it was, and it was like, this is the percentage of books that feature um, disabled characters, which are really small. This is the percentage of books that feature Native Americans. This is the percentage of books, um, like, we looked at religion, right? And Christianity was pretty big, but so was Judaism. But when you really looked at Judaism, it was all about the Holocaust. So it was all trauma. So we realized, like, we need to be more diverse in that we're not just showing that it's all about the Holocaust. And we're not just having books on slavery. You know, we want to try to represent positive aspects of all these different diverse people and cultures.